Well, good morning. People could please take their seats. Right. Again, good morning to everyone and welcome to the Council on Foreign Relations. My name is Richard Haas and I'm the president of this organization. And today, as you all know, we are, host, we are hosting Faisal Abdul Rauf, who is the founder and CEO of the American Society for Muslim Advancement. And he is also the imam, as I expect you all know, of the Masjid al Farah Mosque here in New York City. That's, however, only part of who he is. Uh, imam Faisal is the founder and chair of the Cordoba Initiative, which is dedicated to building bridges between the Muslim and non-Muslim worlds. And he is also, as I expect everyone on the planet by now knows, central to plans for uh, the building of a new Islamic community center to be built adjacent to Ground Zero. Imam Faisal is also uh, an author of several books, including What's Right with Islam, A New Vision for Muslims and the West. Uh, what the scenario will be this morning is uh, Imam Faisal will speak for 15 or 20 minutes or so from this podium. Then afterwards, he and I will have a relatively brief conversation, after which we will open it to you, our members, uh, for, for questions. And I'll give the ground rules there. In the meantime, if anyone does have anything like a cell phone or anything approximating a cell phone, if you would please uh, turn it off, uh, not just put it on uh, vibrate, which interferes with our phone system, we will be uh, forever grateful. Uh, this meeting this morning, uh, as you might have figured out from the cameras in the back and the rest, is uh, on the record. Uh, so with that, uh, Imam Faisal, let me uh, welcome you not here simply, not simply this morning, but welcome back to the Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you very much. It is customary for Muslims to begin by first invoking the name of the all-merciful and all-compassionate Creator, the Creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is between them, the God of Abraham, the God of Ishmael and Isaac, the God of Moses and Aaron, the God of Jesus Christ and his mother Mary, and the God of Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon all of these noble prophets and messengers. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you. I'm indeed honored to be here today at this distinguished organization, and I thank Richard Haas and the Council of Foreign Relations for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this morning. We come together at a time of great crisis and danger. What began as a dispute over a community center in Lower Manhattan has spawned and grown into a much larger controversy about the relationship between my beloved religion and my beloved country, between Islam and America. The events of the past few weeks have really saddened me to my very core. I regret that some have, mis that some have misunderstood our intentions. I'm deeply distressed that in this heated political season, some have exploited this issue for their own agendas. And I'm deep disappointed that so many of the arguments have been based on deliberate misinformation and harmful stereotypes. But despite the disappointments, there is much I'm thankful for. First, I'm grateful to our mayor, Michael Bloomberg, and to so many others who have spoken out in favor of our project. Their positive responses have filled my heart, and I thank them all. To our, present Barack, to our President Barack Obama, Mr. President, I thank you for your support for speaking out so forcefully and repeatedly on behalf of religious tolerance and the values that make our country great. And I'm deeply grateful for your robust, persistent efforts in making peace in the Middle East a priority in your first term. And for all of those who have voiced their objections to our plans, with civility, with respect, and with open minds and hearts, I am also grateful. You affirm my belief in the decency and morality of the American people. I do recognize that among the critics are some who have lost loved ones on 9-11. To all of them, I offer my 
heartfelt sympathy and my prayers upon their departed souls. Every year we mark the anniversary with great sadness, but with even greater resolve to fight against the radical philosophies that have been used to justify these acts. My goal here today is twofold. First, to reach out to my brothers and sisters of different faiths in America to explain and to share my love of my religion. And second, to reach out to my Muslim brothers and sisters all over the world to explain and share my love of America. This is my personal mission and is anchored in my own experience. Allow me, please, to begin by telling you my story. Like many of your ancestors, I came to America by boat when I was only 17 years old. We sailed into New York Harbor on a sunny and cold winter day in December 1965, three days before Christmas. I remember seeing the Statue of Liberty for the first time, that beacon of freedom rising and looming majestically in the harbor. I remember admiring her strength and her beauty and her colors in the morning crisp sunlight. I had no idea what life would be like in America, but I looked forward to it. I was born in Kuwait to Egyptian parents. My father was a religious scholar who studied and graduated at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, an Islamic institution of great distinction and learning. He was sent to this country by Al-Azhar to head a growing Muslim community in New York City. He was active in what was used to be called the ecumenical movement, promoting understanding between different religions. Today we call it interfaith dialogue. For me, coming from a country where the majority was Muslim, I found this society remarkably non-religious, even anti-religious. In the 1960s, religion was considered by many to be passé, a crutch for the feeble-minded. I remember the cover of Time magazine that screamed out, Is God dead? This was shocking to me, extraordinary. And I thought to myself, wow, this place sure is different. I got my bachelor's in physics at Columbia University. I married, raised my children here, and I had a number of occupations. A high school teacher, a salesman of industrial products, and a struggling writer. I'm a typical New Yorker, ladies and gentlemen. I am an American. In 1979, I became a naturalized U U.S. citizen. I believe, and still believe, and pledged allegiance to the values of the United States Constitution. And I know that these sacred rights were won by the blood of brave American soldiers. My own niece, my own niece currently serves in the United States Army. I know that this country was founded by individuals who left their countries of origin because they were unhappy with their government and with the restrictions imposed on religious life and liberties. They wanted something better. Participatory government, freedom of speech, separation of church and state. These were among my earliest lessons in American civic life. In America, we do protect these differences. We protect different expressions of faith. We assemble in our various houses of worship to pray, to chant, to recite our sacred scriptures, or simply to come together in communion and draw together and draw strength as a community. But religion in America is not imposed on us. We can be as devout or as agnostic as we like. That choice to be or not to be religious, or anything else for that matter, forced me to think about who I was, who I am, what I truly wanted and chose to be, and has given me a profound appreciation for the country that provides these freedoms. In that sense, you could say that I found my faith in this country. So for me, Islam and America are organically bound together. But 
This is not my story alone. The American way of life has helped many Muslims make a conscious decision to embrace their faith. That choice, ladies and gentlemen, is precious. And that is why America is precious. I discovered that the country that at first had seemed so anti-religious, in fact has a profoundly spiritual base and a religious purpose. The founding fathers of this nation were men of faith. Within the governing documents they created, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, they affirmed their most sacred spiritual values. These documents are legal expressions of, in fact, a religious ideal, non-parochial but substantively religious, that is rooted in the commandments and principles of the three faiths practiced by the people of the book, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And to remind us, even when we're in the markets, they imprinted in our currency, in God we trust. Since 1983, I have served as imam or prayer leader of a mosque in Tribeca. It is in the same neighborhood as the World Trade Center, just 12 blocks north. The Twin Towers defined our skyline and our neighborhood and were part of our daily lives. Our congregants come from all over the world and from every walk of life, from congressmen to taxi drivers. On September 11th, a number of them tragically lost their lives. Our community grieved alongside our neighbors, and together we helped slowly rebuild Lower Manhattan. I belong to this neighborhood, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a devout Muslim. I pray five times a day, sometimes more if I can, and I observe the rituals required by my faith. And I'm also a proud American citizen. Let no one forget that. I vote in elections. I pay taxes. I pledge allegiance to the flag. And I'm a Giants fan. <laughs> I'm glad they won yesterday. Both this country and the teachings of my faith have nourished me in fundamental, essential ways, have shaped me. Both have shaped up and made up my core identity as a human being. But ladies and gentlemen, as I intimated earlier, this is not just my story. It is the immigrant, it is the American immigrant story. It is your story and that of your parents and your grandparents. As President Obama made clear in his remarks in Cairo last year, American Muslims have enriched this country throughout its history. Since the 1800s, American history has been intertwined with the history of Muslims. Many thousands of African Muslims were brought here as slaves, and this became their home. In the 1950s and 1960s, from the music of the blues and jazz, they took up the cause of freedom in the civil rights movement, and we witnessed the emergence of Islam in the African American community. Their struggle and their story is central to the story and the narrative of Islam in America. From them to the more recently immigrated Sudanese in Minnesota, to the Syrians and Lebanese in North Dakota, to the Egyptians and North Africans in Astoria, Queens, they are Americans. We are Americans. It's not about them. It's about us and who we are, and who we want to be as Americans. When we fast, pray, donate to charities, observe our commandments, we exemplify not only the ideals of the Founding Fathers, but also the deepest values of our faith traditions. As immigrants, we absorb American culture from generation to a generation. But the challenge of fitting in is often made more difficult by rejection. Other groups and faiths have found themselves targets of such prejudice. Jews and Catholics, Irish and Italians, blacks and Hispanics, in time.